right, hello everyone, and welcome to White Collar Crime, Criminal Justice 335. My name is Colin May. I'm a professor here at Stevenson University, and I am very excited to have uh, you all in this class uh, this semester. So, uh, should be really a great uh, a great time. Looking forward to all the discussions and the great uh, things that we're going to be talking about. So, tonight I want to. Uh, put a few things uh, on your plate, kind of get you thinking about things, where things are at here in, uh, in the course, and, and what really delve in a little bit more to what white collar crime really is. And I think that it's really important to understand some of the concepts uh, that we'll be talking about throughout the rest of the semester, because it's a really important to understand um, what we're talking about with some of these things. So this presentation is going to be uh, fairly brief, but it's going to put some some context into some of the things that you'll be reading about and, and certainly some of the topics we'll be discussing throughout the semester. So, uh, you know, white collar crime is a really interesting phrase. It's been defined so many different ways. Um, there's a lot of academic uh, discussion about back and forth about the usefulness of those definitions and, and and really it kind of is interesting to me as a practitioner I mean I spent 10 years as a, as a criminal investigator and a special agent and it, uh, it it's really an interesting dichotomy between the focus on theoretical um, you know and academic definitions of white-collar crime and the practical aspects of investigating and responding to white collar crimes, things that are done on a day-to-day -day basis by investigators, prosecutors, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we'll be talking about a lot of these kinds of things, and uh, you know, I, I urge you to um, you know ask questions, post uh, you know topics to the discussion board that you want to know more about or you're not not sure about things like that. So uh, that way you can get a better sense, um, you know, of the different uh, topics that are out there and the different areas of, of interest to you. So when you talk about white collar crime, and, and you'll read a little bit about this in the book, uh, this was Edwin Sutherland from Indiana University, and he, he was the president of the American Sociological Society in 1939, and he gave this speech that basically said, we are neglecting a whole uh, portion of uh, criminological research and, and socioeconomic uh, you know, data because we've been so focused on street level crimes or violent crime or things that really are impacting um, the communities in, in negative ways, but that we can see. And, and he said, the problem is that we don't always see this white collar crime. We don't see the, the economic issues, um, you know, and, and that. So he was really trying to get people uh, to raise the awareness of, of this issue. Um, you know, and he wanted the, the justice system to really reconsider um, dealing how they dealt with these types of criminals, uh, thinking that, you know, these are issues that really need to be addressed globally um, within the justice system and, and by government and, and academics. So, you know, a lot of these things, um, you know, this kind of really uh, became apparent in 1939. And of course, you have to think about this in terms of the, the context of it. Uh, the Depression was, uh, you know, kind of in its, you know, last throes uh, prior to the lead up to World War II. Uh, there was a lot of unemployment. There were a lot of issues with cheating and, uh, you know, the, the problems that come with uh, these types of, uh, you know, large-scale economic events. So there was a lot of, uh, I mean, this, that's a whole other discussion, but uh, but it's really, really interesting. I do want to point out, too, that since then there has been a lot of research that has shown that the harm to victims is the same or worse um, than street crimes. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's 
very similar. The reaction to financial crimes and, and, and things like that are very, very similar to a very traumatic event, things like um, deaths and car accidents and murders and things like that. Um, and in some cases, it's actually more harsh because the really is a loss of trust. And usually um, this happens with people that you know um, who are doing this. And uh, and there's just a whole host of issues that, that go with it. So, uh, so that's the origin of white collar crime. Now we'll kind of move on to some definitions. So this is this is really kind of the definition of the FBI uses. Um, it's a full range of frauds committed by uh, both business and government professionals. It's really characterized by this deceit, a concealment of information or concealment of assets, um, and the violation of the trust. Um, they are not dependent on on physical force, harm, or violence. Um, it, it really is a, a greed-based crime. It's financial. Um, you know, in some cases, the victims are uh, are giving money over to to the person because they think they're going to get something from it. Um, or, you know, perpetrators can use uh, their position and their the, the economic knowledge that they have to avoid losing money. Things like um, uh, securities fraud and, and stuff that we'll talk about later on in the book, um, you know, they can get a, a personal advantage to to uh, over and above what everybody else has to deal with. So it's it's really cheating is, is in a sense what it is. And it's not a victimless crime. I mean, it's, it's a real, uh, it hurts. It really does. If you've ever been the victim of identity theft or you know, credit card scam or anything like that, you, you know exactly what it's like. So let's look at a, a couple other definitions. Obviously, the first one is, is Sutherland's definition of crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of his occupation. Uh, some people didn't like this uh, definition because it really focused on the person as opposed to the, uh, the method. Um, the National White Collar Crime Center in a 2010 report uh, said that it was more of an illegal or unethical acts that violate a fiduciary responsibility or public trust uh, for personal or organizational gain. And again, that's pretty pretty broad. So um, we kind of cover a lot of uh, those types of issues. Uh, another one here where you have uh, the, the Reese and uh, Bitterman from 1980, uh, violations of law, uh, which penalties are attached involving the use of a violator's position of economic power, influence, or trust in a legitimate economic or political institution for the purpose of some illegal gain or to commit an illegal act. That's pretty good. It's actually, um, I believe, Gil Geis, um, you'll probably read some of his uh, material in the book, um, is probably one of the most famous criminologists to uh, deal with white collar crime since, um, since uh, Edwin Sutherland. And this was apparently his uh, favorite definition. And then, of course, you have Jay Albanese, who's a, an expert on white-collar crime and organized crime. Um, and his uh, definition is the planned or organized illegal acts of deception or fraud usually accomplished during the course of um, an occupational activity. Um, and so, again, there's, there's a lot of discussion about different types of definitions. I like to think of white collar crime not only in the definition, but really in the typology. And again, that goes back to being a practitioner. How does this impact me on a daily basis? So you have kind of three levels of, of crime. The first is the theft crime. So you have embezzlement, extortion, forgery, fraud, uh, theft of, of property. Uh, you have the intellectual property violations like uh, counterfeiting and things like that. And then you have, of course, your computer crimes. Then the second set is is this crimes against public administration, and these are the the governmental or corruption types of crimes 
where uh, people are taking advantage of some government program or their government position uh, to really wreak havoc and, and, and obtain personal gain. And so, you know, bribery, corruption, obstruction of justice, um, any kind of misconduct. But then you also have other things like uh, false statements on applications, loan fraud, uh, things where uh, there's a program or a benefit. I mean, the Veterans Administration could be an example. Social Security fraud would be a, another good example of programs that are being victimized by, by uh, individuals outside of the government. And then the third is kind of an interesting um, concept. And, and when I first started in this job as, a, uh, as an investigator for the government, it didn't really occur to me that these were – I was not very interested in these at, at first. But then it really dawned on me that this is – this is really goes to a lot of what white-collar crime is. It starts out as a civil – or administrative regulatory offense and then and then continues to grow and grow and grow until it snowballs into crime a true crime um, you know and and just you see the list here it's a lot of different things um, so that's uh, you know it's just a really interesting and a great career opportunities here um, to to as an investigator uh, in for law firms um, or doing regulatory compliance on the government or private sector side um, it, it's really fascinating it's a huge huge industry so when we talk about white collar crime the the common elements there are three common elements it's power money and and secrecy or, or something hidden the the money is 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 key to this because without the money then you know all you really have is is a bad you know conspiracy movie um, but power is you know you have somebody who either is seeking power or seeking to retain their power um, or in a position of authority or trust access to something to something of value and and that is a key component too there's always a greed factor. There's you again. It's either about making money or not losing money or or assets. Um, but then you also look at the crime itself needs to be hidden. In so many white collar cases, the problem is that the victim doesn't even really know that that a crime has been committed. So there are issues with that whole thing they just don't know that it even happened um, uh, to report it so that becomes a huge issue so let's talk about illegal acts because I know it's been been talked about a lot really these can be civil or criminal so of course criminal violations are punishable by a term in jail usually between uh, over a year is a felony and under a year is a misdemeanor. You could also be uh, civil or regulatory violations, and these are really punishable um, only by fines. Um, they can also enjoin the defendant or the respondent uh, to stop doing something or uh, barring them from participating in government programs, for instance. Um, but again, there's no jail time. Uh, built into those to those pe uh, penalties but again as we talked about it before it, it snowballs so be very careful uh, when you're looking at those um, thinking just in terms of oh well this is just a regulatory violation well it, it may be and it just may be that it takes a little bit more time to develop the criminal side of it um, you have false statements and uh, omissions um, you also have material misrepresentations. You could have things like forged documents or um, manufactured information, things like that. Uh, and of course, profit's always the motive. And so, again, when we define fraud, it is a representation to a victim about a material fact that's actually false. 
um, and is done intentionally or recklessly and the victim believes it and acts up upon it, does something, usually give over money, and that's to the victim's uh, disadvantage. And, and they are out of that money because they don't get their um, – what was promised to them because it probably didn't exist in the first place. So here are just some of the categories of white-collar crime. You have consumer scams. You have pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes. Some of these are used interchangeably, and that's not entirely accurate. Um, affinity frauds we'll, we'll delve into. I'm really excited about that because uh, these, are, these are really, really dangerous because they, they entrap and ensnare whole groups of people who are usually pretty trusting. Church groups um, are often uh, the victims of affinity fraud, things like um, members of the uh, local American Legion or the Elks or some other fraternal or social organization um, relies on kind of that bond and that kinship and, and they're taken advantage of uh, big time. Um, you have insurance frauds. You have, again, things like intellectual property theft. I mean, problems with movie, you know, stealing movies, um, illegal uh, downloading of songs and things like that. People think that it's not a, it doesn't, it's not going to hurt anybody, but it actually is, is a big, big problem. Um, we won't get into that uh, as much in this class. Um, but it is it is actually growing, uh, and there's some really interesting research out there about it. Um, inventory theft, embezzlement, abuse of power, mortgage fraud, healthcare fraud. I mean, you name it, they're uh, they're all out there. So uh, if you if any of these strike your interest, um, we can certainly talk more about it in the course of the the semester. So how, how do you study white collar crime? Well, you can do it from so many different vantage points, which is really a neat opportunity. And, and I think you'll see a lot of this in the book. Um, you really can look at it from who the offenders or perpetrators are, what kind of positions that they hold. Um, you can also look at the networks that kind of run these types of scams. I mean, things like uh, there are Jamaican telemarketing scams or reshipping scams that have recently uh, been in the news uh, where the government has gotten convictions of, of individuals who are doing this. Um, so you can look at it kind of from a, a network base. Um, you can also look at motivations and, and psychology. I mean, that's a fascinating uh, aspect of, of the, the perspectives of white collar crime. You also have the victims. Who are the actual victims? What characteristics and commonalities do they have? Um, but you can also look at the scam types. I mean, that's a lot of what we've – the book is basically broken down into this kind of uh, type of scam, if you will, or category. Um, you can also look at the legal portion of it. I mean, you can charge somebody with wire fraud for – dozens of types of crimes um, that have nothing to do with each other but but yet are linked by the common um, mode of transmission which is the wire so internet telephone uh, fax things like that then of course you have the methodology of the actual crime itself and how it was uh, uncovered or detected uh, but then you also have the the idea that um, some of these are very, very preventable, and how do you, how do you deal with that uh, issue of uh, prevention and, and victim, uh, you know, dealing with the victims in the aftermath and things like that. So really, everybody wants to know, well, why should we study white collar crime? Well, your aunt Stevenson, um, to get this degree to hopefully help you figure out kind of what you want to do and give you some skills and some knowledge and training in in the very uh, field that you really want to go work in. And this is, this is just an amazing field. It, it is probably one of the 
better field, in my personal opinion. Um, I don't like blood and guts. Uh, I, I don't like, um, you know, problems where, you know, you got to figure out he said, she said, or, you know, uh, things like that. So I love white collar crime because it is, it is more of a puzzle. It's that uh, follow the money uh, angle. And, and I will, I can vouch for everything on this page. Uh, you know, it is paper intensive, but it really is fascinating. It's so interesting. Um, you know, it really does result in, in those bigger high profile cases. Um, you know, if you want to seize money and, 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 you know, take stuff away from the bad guy, this is where it's at. Um, and again, you'll, you know, all the, all the cases that you read about in the books, uh, or, or online, there it's all true. I mean, it's it's intense media coverage. It's very significant, uh, you know, oversight and and scrutiny. Um, but what's great about it is that it also has probably the broadest career opportunities in both the public and the private sector. So. If you're going to be a DNA typologist or a fingerprint examiner, a latent print examiner, or a tool mark examiner, your ability to work is really confined to those uh, government agencies that, that require a lab. Um, excuse my, uh, my dog there. The, um, the, back to this. Uh, but the nice thing about having a, um, a white collar crime background and, and training is that it really is so much more expansive in the, um, in, in the private sector. I mean, you have forensic accountants who are CPAs, you have forensic auditors, um, you have cyber crime specialists, you have, um, banking compliance and, and money laundering, anti-money laundering investigators. So it, it really is much, much broader. And, and that white collar crime background is, is absolutely critical for that. So when we look at some of the typologies, we talked about the offenders uh, and the perpetrators. So let's kind of break that down a little bit. You have crimes that are committed by individuals who are acting in their professional capacity. Uh, lawyers, accountants, bank tellers, things like that, um, or excuse me, financial planners would be would be a better example. Then you have employees against their employers, and that would be where your bank teller um, embezzled funds uh, from from the bank. Um, you also have senior managers or officials who who are doing this uh, for the benefit of their employer. And these are things like Enron, WorldCom, um, securities frauds, um, accounting frauds, where they're really trying to uh, bump up uh, the way that their company looks, their, their employer. You also have agents and employees of a corporation um, or the employer uh, who are victimizing consumers. So this is things like identity theft or some kind of healthcare uh, issue. You also have merchants uh, who are victimizing consumers through things like stealing credit card information. But then you also have individuals who are uh, victimizing public agencies or public programs uh, in income tax evasion or false applications for, for loans or uh, benefits or things like that would, would be uh, – would be an example. And then finally, of course, you have um, employees against the public agency, um, administration of government, things like elected officials who are taking bribes or kickbacks, um, uh, regulatory inspectors who are uh, on the, the, the payroll, things like that. So when we kind of look at the consumer frauds in module one, we're really looking at the, the consumer as the victim. And then you have different types. And, and I've broken this down a little bit differently than, than the book does. But, but basically, when you have, you have false advertising, uh, and again, those are uh, things that 
may be civil, not criminal. Uh, but again, they could all certainly lead to criminal issues. Then you have price fixing, where you have um, basically antitrust violations, and a lot of these do end up becoming criminal uh, because of the collusion and the conspiracy. You have product substitution, uh, substandard products, and this is, happens a lot in defense contracts where um, the bolt for the F-15 um, is not is not the specified bolt that should be there and and you know the plane ends up crashing and killing the pilot and you know 10 other people because of that bolt that because it was substandard and that becomes a major problem um, and and is a huge focus for for the government um, you also have health and safety frauds um, things like dangerous drugs unsanitary food um, quackery unregulated medical devices and then you have uh, just kind of general frauds and and I like to um, if you ever watch NBC News the Today Show the Rawson reports Jeff Rawson um, has a lot of these kinds of things so I find it's always interesting to watch those um, I think they're they're unique reports you know any kind of that investigative journalism um, is very, very interesting because it gives you a sense of what's going on out there and, and certainly what to be uh, thinking of and looking for and, and be wary of. So that's about it for me. Um, just wanted to say thanks for coming into this class. I, I really hope um, that it's a great experience for you. Um, my goal is to um, try to do a few of these video casts, video lectures throughout the course to do a little bit more um, deep dive into some of the topics. So um, if you have any suggestions or thoughts um, or, or something really, you know, piques your interest, let me know, send me an email or post it to the discussion board. And of course, if you um, have any questions for anyone, um, or you find a job that you're interested in or an agency that you want to know more about, you know, let's talk about it. That's why the discussion board is there. So um, interesting cases, interesting articles, um, things that come up that make you go, huh, well, that's interesting. Just throw them on the discussion board. Let's, uh, let's have a good discussion. That's the whole, that's really the whole point of, of this class. Uh, and of course, if there is an issue or an emergency, let me know right away. Um, as soon as you can, I, I understand, you know, um, things happen. It's, it's the re real world. I, I totally get that. Uh, so just keep me in the loop. I'll do as much as I can to help uh, make the transition uh, smooth and effective. But of course, I can't do anything if I don't know what's going on. So um, just let me know. And if you need anything, just uh, shoot me an email. So I wanted to leave you with this last quote. Um, the world of white collar crime enforcement is a broad one, transcending lines of geography, organization, and subject matter jurisdiction. It really is good. It's, there's, there's something for everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any questions and have a great week. Thanks.